features Janet Connors. I refer to her as Mama J. She's my other mother. Her daughter uh, is one of my best friends. She's like a sister to me. She has two boys, one of them alive and the other one, Jojo, was killed. He was stabbed to death at 19 years old. So what Mama J does and what we do together is we go places and we talk about restorative justice. We talk about how do you deal with these things and how do you deal with them in a real way. Not one that represses it, not one that consumes you with rage, but one that actually holds people accountable. And so today the word that we're using is forgiveness. But we're not using forgiveness in a way um, that's like, I don't know how to I explain it. Mama J often says forgiveness and accountability are on the same, two sides of the same coin. You understand what I'm saying? So like, this forgiveness, I can do that because I don't want you to live in my head or in my heart or in my mind. Like, I forgive that person because I don't want to live with that person in my, like, I got to let you go, right? And then there's forgiveness that says, well, there's forgiveness. How do I hold you accountable? What are the things you're going to do in order to be held to a standard that shows me that you really actually truly want forgiveness and that you're wanting to be a part of this community? So this video shows a 15-minute clip. My cards on the table is very personal for me. I've seen it twice. The last time I seen it, I had to step out. But I really appreciate it, and I'm happy it was made because people have to see it. It's about, I think, 12 minutes long. The only thing I ask is, and this is what I tell my people, if you're bored, pretend you're not. And if you're bored, don't distract the person to your right or your left. I don't think you will be. I think you'll appreciate it. And then after that, we'll shift into um, um, a dialogue about that. So, yeah, it is a documentary, meaning this is real life that we're watching, right? Um, yeah, thank you. And for us, one of the things is, right, because you can hear statistics, I mean, um, you can hear about, you know, the amount of people like, okay, you know, 78 people were killed in Boston last year. You could hear a statistic like that, right? But when you're able to put a face an actual story uh, for people who don't experience that, um, and for people who do experience that, what that does is it validates our struggle and gives us other opportunities in terms of ways that we can deal with our grief, um, deal with our anger. So we wanted to show this. Word. And there he is. Well, 
it's a loaded question, but raise your hand if you think people that go into prison are coming out and they're, for the most part, coming out better than they went in. Okay, there's a couple of hands, right? But the prevailing, the prevailing thought is, is, if you think no, raise your hand. So the prevailing thought, we know, for the most part, we actually have an understanding that for the most part, people that are going in are not getting the things that they needed. In fact, whenever we need to cut funding, they cut it there first, right? They take away programs, options. Yeah, I actually used to work in prisons. Um, and I wasn't a CEO or anything to that effect, but bringing education to the prisons um, and jails. So in Boston, surrounding areas, and one of the statistics to throw out is actually two-thirds of the people who touch those prison or jail doors go right back in. So, you know, uh, one out, you know, two out of three people who are in prison go right back. Part of that reason is why, is they don't have the supports in there nor outside. People still do the same things, hang with the same people, um, get into the same trouble, right? Um, so really, uh, one of those things I think you're talking about is if that's not working, right, I'm a teacher. If you won't get, you know, if you get two questions wrong and only get one right, it's not necessarily a pass or grade. Right, so why would we look at the prison system in the same way? And the thing about Mama J is, Mama J is a name, and she's a mama to the community. Right? Um, and I want to bring a parallel just to kind of talk about, like we were just talking about, because we're going through my whole neighborhood, um, the street that I grew up on. Um, um, and there was actually my neighbor, uh, the person's house that was next to me, um, the, one of my friends, um, he had actually killed, he was also going through some mental trouble, he killed both of his sisters. Um, before he was assassinated by police officers. Um, and so you had parents who were having a funeral for three people. Mm. And you know what people were saying? Why is he, you know, going to have a funeral with his two sisters, right? Since he was the person who killed them, why would you have him in the same place as your other children? But as a mother of a community, you have to understand that everybody is your child. So the people who were victims, the people who are survivors, and Mama J, for example, my sister used to live with it. Uh, they used to live in Dorchester. Uh, so she's really you know, a community mother. And this idea of understanding, even though that somebody in my community took the life of my son, the only way that we can make our community stronger is if I help them to be successful. Because I saw a lot of people raise their hands when they were like, prison's not helping. So if prison's not helping, then who's out there when people are coming back out? So I'm just going to ask an optimist myself to play the aisle. Um, I just would like to see if there's anybody, just quick thoughts on what you just saw. It could be a sentence, it could be one word. The guy that was talking to Mama J, uh -huh. that was one of the guys that was there in the fight that was going on. Was he the one that stabbed or was he, he, was, he was the one that stabbed? The reason that he came out was, was, it, was it because um, the guy that was killed went inside their, their house or was it like that? Let me explain. Actually, no. Um, Jojo was asleep in the room, in his room. Uh, Jojo was 6'4", six, 6'5", six, he's a big dude. And so he was asleep, and these guys, when I was talking, they broke into their house. They wanted to rob the car, get the keys, etc. He was asleep in this room. His two friends, one of them was, was pistol whipped, the other one is on the floor. And um, Jojo came out like, yo, what's that? You know what's going on? He's a big dude. So as soon as they seen him, what their, their fear was like, oh, he's going to hurt us. So they, they killed him. And the one that was on the, on the video, <clears throat> the one that was in the videos uh, uh, was behind him, and the one that actually stabbed him, <clears throat> we don't, he doesn't work with Mama J. He's, he's, he's uh, maybe a lost cause. Um, but there were four people responsible, and um, two of the people are out, one of them is still in. And her whole thought process was they are going to come out. Two of them came out, they bled uh, guilty, they turned state's evidence, they did like 10, 12, uh, uh, they weren't responsible for the actual, so they were willing to take the stand. Um, the, the dude that um, actually was responsible uh, took it to court and got him out guilty. On his way out, he smiled at them. You know what I'm saying? 
So, um, and I remember at one point driving uh, uh, down the street, this is off top, I was driving down the street with Shayna, and he was walking down the street, and she was gonna run him over. Because in that moment, she seemed to do that kill her brother. So I literally had to take the wheel from her, and we screeched, and the car just turned, and then he looked over, smiled, and kept going. You understand what I'm saying? It's a very, 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 very hard situation because I stopped her from it, and part of me was like, I don't know if I want to stop her. What do you think that smile meant when he smiled right back at her? He's, he's, I think he's, I think, I, I think he's, he's off. And the other two, so the other two cats, the other two, two folks who have been willing to sit with her, she went to visit in prison before they came out. And she basically wanted to say her piece. You understand what I'm saying? Like, took my child from me. Then there was another visit where she basically said um, to them, there's a list of things that I want you to be held accountable for. One of them is you're going to visit his grave. You're going to see this. You're going to read this list of things. You're going to sign off of them. And we're going to make sure that you're being held accountable because he didn't lose his life so that you can take other people's lives or waste yours. So that was the kind of the ten. You, you, you follow? So thank you for the question so I can clarify that. No, JoJo was in bed. Uh, he was just in bed. Uh, um, any other thoughts, quick thoughts or questions? And then, I'll, and then I'll come over here. I just had a question for you guys. You, um, I had a brother that killed in Puerto Rico about 10 years ago. Got shot a lot of times. And um, I feel like, what, what, what support do you give?
did a project called Anonymous Boston. I don't know if people heard that, but understand. It's over his son Bobby was killed. Um, was it seven years later? Um, what, Matt yeah. Okay, so Azora's son Bobby was killed. She became a peace activist, was working with the mothers, Mama J, etc., doing peace work. As did Matthew. He would come to the he would come and walk, he would be a part of this. He was on his way home and he caught a bullet that wasn't intended for him. So she lost her son, began working as a peace activist, activist was already alert in the community, connecting with other mothers, doing the work, and then her other son was killed. His family. I, um, I spent uh, uh, a total of eight months working on a project called Anonymous Boston. Um, and in it, I photographed um, parents holding images of their children. And Azora was a part of that project. Um, and one, what we were doing was, and to answer what you just said, one of the most powerful healing tools that we can do as human beings, because everybody's like, oh, I can't do that. I can't be that strong. I can't. One of the most Powerful healing tools that you can do as a human being is bear witness. You know how like at one point you're like, I don't really even know how to, how to deal with it, right? I mean, we all evolve, right? We all, we're all taking the photos. Of, I think this was all for them. When it was done, they left with the images. You understand? And um, the first opening night was just for them. And so what they told me, how many people, uh, maybe you rock a pin for a loved one, or you know people who rock pins for their loved ones? Yeah. Um, Acknowledge that. I do. I now do that. I'll be sitting on the bus and my man might come on with a pin in his hat and I'll say, hey, excuse me, who's that? They say, oh, that's my cousin Little, and I'll be like, I'm sorry to hear that. It's just one way that I get because why are they wearing it? So that they can be invisible or so that they can be visible? Why are they have it on their t shirt? Why are they walking? Why are they telling? So for me, it's just that one moment of bearing witness and acknowledging that your pain does exist. And that this is real for you because sometimes we get to these places and we become kind of like, I don't want to say this, I don't want to say that. And especially around birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, that's when I check in. That's what I want to check in. So that's when you call, even though it's going to be hard, just to say, I was thinking about you. Right? Just to, because that existence, acknowledging it, is healing. And like what she said that I really love, and she learned it from doing some work in prison. Now, people say hurt people, hurt people all the time. If you haven't heard it, now you've heard it. Hurt people hurt people. She followed that by saying, healed people heal people. Right? And Optimus said something about healing. It's an everyday thing. Like, I, I, if I ate um, breakfast today, does that mean I don't need breakfast for the next week? I eat it again the next day, right? Or food. If I need food today to sustain myself, unless I'm fasting, I need it to keep sustaining myself. And eventually, even if I'm fasting, to stay alive. Healing is the same way for me. You don't just go, oh yeah, I already did that. I'm good now. The next day, you think of other ways that you can keep evolving and growing. For me, that, that means speaking, sharing, being acknowledged, and going to the walks and bringing up that. Because just that it exists, a lot of times what people want to do is put it under the rug, under the rug and that does nobody any good, except for the people who would like for us to not exist. That's why I call it anonymous. That's why it's called anonymous mom.
new strength. And oftentimes when I will find the words when somebody has lost somebody with the trauma, that's what I say is I wish you strength. Um, first, I just wanted to talk about your office. Um, up this point area, that's where I used to live in Dorchester. Um, so I know the area well. And I would like to say that she emanates love. If anybody sees her walking down the street, if there's like this beam of light, you get one of the best hugs that you can ever get. <laughs> um, and it's interesting because though she went through so much pain, um, she's continuing to heal other people um, while, she, while she went through that. Um, wow. Um, I would say, like, we, we have lunch coming up, because um, I, I think you brought up a lot of uh, powerful points. Um, and I think we should have a conversation at lunchtime um, so we can talk, you know, um, talk to people about that. And I definitely want to appreciate you sharing your stories, um, you know, in terms of real life. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you. Senseless for a reason. 
illogical for a reason. There's no real understanding as to why. Um, there are symptoms. There are people who are going around with PTSD and no one's talking to them. There are people who are hurting and people see them as potential enemies. Um, there are set up, people die over streets that they do not even own. Right? They rep blocks that aren't even theirs. They belong to someone else. So we, we're in that position where these things are conditioned in our, in, in our systemic. Optimus was good.
in the video was that uh, when the gentleman that Mom and Jay is working with uh, put her on the same level, said that he's committed to three women, his mother, his wife, and Mama Jay. And I just found that the fact that she had that impact on him was like astounding to me because, you know, your mom's your mom. And if you're putting somebody on the same level as your mom or your wife, that is, it's a really big deal. And that really struck a chord with me.
Excuse me, sorry, my brother, excuse me. We're gonna take two more comments and then wrap this portion um, so that we can grow. <laughs> <laughs>
Amen. So, e Rock and Op are staying with us and will be here after lunch. Uh, so we hope that you all stay. I know that some of the RBS kids leave, but we, we would encourage you to stay. We're going to go into lunch in a minute. We have a couple of announcements to make. First off, for United Neighbors to be able to do this Peace by Peace Summit, it takes a lot of support and help. So we'd like to publicly acknowledge South Coast Hospital that provided tons of money for us to give you some great food, and St. Anne's Hospital that also contributed for us to be able to give you food. concerns and your needs and um, you know young man here talking about the elderly you know just gave me an idea I don't know how often you you all or youth bill gets out and goes over and meets with some of the elderly housing people you know that live in the housing and give them a hand or a hug or whatever it is they need and I think that's so important to break down these barriers and these stigmas and these, um, these misconceptions uh, I couldn't be prouder to be here today with all of you so if you need me, you'll know where to find me. Christian does, and I'm honored to be here with my colleague in government, Rep. Paul Schmidt. Thank you. And I would just like to thank uh, Wendy and Christian and everyone else who was involved here. Wendy, you said that you grew up in the 60s with tie-dye and yeah, so where is I just, I, I, hey, and I just so wanted to say that I grew up in the 50s, and where I went to school, we had to dress like this, except with a tie, uh, every day. And I remember so well that the way we expressed our own culture was, we would turn, we would turn on our collar, like that. <laughs> And if a teacher ever caught us with our collar up like this, it was, see you later, principal's office. So I guess we all figure out ways. Oh, and another thing we did was we would put little metal, uh, little metal heel plates on, on the backs of, of our heels so that when we walked down the corridor, we would go click. Like, 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 like. So, uh, you know, some things change the way 
we express ourselves and some things don't change that we all want to express ourselves and we all want respect. Thank you very much. We'd also like to acknowledge in the back of the room, City Councilman Jay Zakaria, you want to stand up? in peace activities in the city of Fall River since the time that he was in high school. One of the first uh, people that worked on the Fall River Youth Bill of Rights. We are one of the few cities in the state that actually has a Youth Bill of Rights, and you might want a chance to talk to him a little bit. So Jess is going to go over some rules about lunch and how we're moving into there. There's plenty of food, so don't worry. Today has sparked a lot of um, feelings inside. Um, we spoke about the recidivism rate. We spoke about we spoke about forgiveness. We spoke about a lot of things here. Um, I too am from Boston, from every bad neighborhood you want to name, from Castlegate, Mattapan, Lytic Street. That's that's where I come from. I um I did a lot of time in prison, and we had the discussion about people that either got better from in prison or are they the same. I chose to change my life. I, I got my GED in prison and I went to college in prison and now I'm working with these fine young men and women over here paying my dues, giving back to my community. My experiences is that I've been a drug addict, I've been everything that you want to name, but one thing I do know is that I'm working with these young men and women so that they can work with these young men and women because we must pass it on. If we don't pass it on, then we're destined to do. Thank you.